I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. <clears throat> Paul has some good words to say to us. He writes, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. I would like you to come with me on a trip. We're gonna go around the world quickly because last evening at eight o'clock, while well, whatever you were doing, maybe home watching television, perhaps returning from a movie or dinner out with friends, at that time, Christians in Australia and Japan and Korea, they met for worship. And, and then about midnight last night, the church in India and Indonesia and Iran. They gathered also for worship, but probably in some of those places it was, well, it was in secret. And at one point in all of these places that I've just mentioned, at one point a leader, an elder, or somebody went to a communion table and took a loaf of bread and said to the flock of Jesus that was gathered, the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and said, broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the wee hours of the morning today in Syria and Jerusalem, the church of Jesus Christ met also for worship, and they met in churches and in places that perhaps knew the very footsteps of Jesus. And just about five or six hours ago in Germany and Scandinavia, in England and in Africa, the faithful of God gathered for worship in cathedrals where light streams through those beautiful stained glass windows or in makeshift structures of thatch. And again, in these countries, a leader stood before the people and took the cup and reminded them of the words of Jesus where he said in the same manner after supper. He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As we meet here today at North Lake Presbyterian Church, we're very much aware that our neighbors and our friends are meeting in Baptist and Methodist churches, Lutheran and Catholic churches, and they're meeting not just in our area and Florida, but all up and down the East Coast, and it's going to spread all the way across to the Pacific time zone, up north to Canada, down to Mexico, and then to Alaska, Hawaii, and out to the Pacific Islands. And wherever the church of Jesus Christ is meeting today, they're meeting in all different kinds of buildings and structures. Some of them are, yes, beautiful modern buildings. Some are old cathedrals and historic churches. Some are simply warehouse type buildings or theaters. Some out there in Nebraska and Iowa are old wooden country churches, and some out there on those islands are fragile tin-roofed structures. But again, someone, someone will stand before those congregations and remind the people, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes. Today is World Communion Sunday, and this tradition originated in Shadyside Presbyterian Church, 1933, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, World Communion Sunday is a time when Christians of all cultures do something together. We break the bread and we drink of the cup. And we do this to acknowledge our diversity, for we are very diverse, but also to simultaneously promote Christian unity. 
And in doing so, we are reaffirming a central truth, that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And so today, my purpose is to challenge your thinking about the church and to say that World Communion Sunday gives us an opportunity to endorse three distinctive blessings. And here they are. Number one, World Communion Sunday honors our diversity. This is the them in the sermon title. When I took us on a trip around the world, I had a purpose in mind, and that was hoping that you would realize by the time we got done that, well, that not all the Christians worship in the same type of structures. And of course, they don't all worship in the same manner. In fact, we don't all believe and follow the same confessions and traditions. From the beginning of the church age, this is the way it was. Christians lived among each other in great diversity. And, and it was this mixture of so many different ways of doing it that has caused through the centuries countless church splits, way too many denominations, major conflicts, and even war. And I somehow can't help but think that all of that pains the heart of God. So maybe you're asking a question. How did all of that happen? Where did it get started? Who was the instigator of it, if you please? Well, let me suggest perhaps it was a disciple, and his name was John. We read in Mark chapter 9 a sad event, at least it is to me a sad event, because this event and the attitude here has shown itself in the fabric of Christianity for over 2,000 years. Let me read it. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 38. John said to him, that's to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something you have heard someone say to you? You're not one of us because you're not doing it this way. Or I'm not part of you and I won't be part of you because you're not doing it this way. I hope that you never said that of someone, but we know that those words are out there in the Christian church. And so how did Jesus respond to this attitude? Well, he said this, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Last week, Valerie and I were chatting at home and she said, here's a good one. She was reading Daily Bread and she read it to me and I said, ooh, that will fit in the sermon. So here it goes. What I just read from the scripture reminds me of the story of two shopkeepers who were bitter rivals. And they spent each day keeping track of the other person's business. And so if one got a customer, he would smile triumphantly at his rival that he got something the other one did not. Well, one night it seems an angel appeared to one of the shopkeepers in a dream and said, I will give you anything that you ask, but Whatever you receive, your competitor will receive twice as much. What is your desire? Well, the shopkeeper frowned for a while and thought and then said, strike me blind in one eye. Now, I suggest that that is jealousy at its worst kind but it is that self-destructive attitude that drives wedges and has driven wedges in the Christian church for centuries. You see, it is so easy, so easy for us to think critically and negatively of other Christ followers who are members of other churches, of other denominations, who come from different ethnicities and have been raised in different cultures. 
And this is the real we, they mentality, and I don't think it sets well with God and Jesus. In fact, maybe I feel that a little bit more strongly because of my, my career as a chaplain in the Navy, because in their Navy, I really confronted and had to live with the great, rich diversity of Christ's church, because I worked with, prayed with, heard sermons from, shared communion in celebrating, receiving, and offering communion with Christians and chaplains of so many denominations and faith traditions that I have lost track of them. And these experiences have enriched me and broadened my appreciation of just how high and how deep and how wide the love and mercy of God is. Second blessing is World Communion Sunday celebrates our unity. This is the us in the sermon title. About a month ago, 33 of us from this church and a few others were in Israel. And on the tour, we went to a place that I consider to be one of the most holy sites in all of Christendom. Now, I consider it holy because to me, it's sort of like a New Testament Mount Carmel. You know, in the Old Testament Mount Carmel, you had Elijah and the prophets of Baal up there in that real high place. And that's where Elijah called down fire from heaven and then he took care of 450 prophets of Baal. Well, the place in the New Testament is Caesarea Philippi. I want you to take a moment and look at this scene on the screen. It's a photo that I took. And I took it near Caesarea Philippi. Somewhere near this cave is where Jesus said some of the most important words to his disciples when he gathered them there. He said those words, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, some consider Caesarea Philippi to be the most pagan place in all of Palestine in the days of Jesus. Because there on Mount Hermon are two temples. One is to Caesar and the other one is to the devoted followers of Pan. And those followers would go into this cave and perform sexual acts so lewd that our tour guide told us he would not describe them to us. Right next to Pan's temple is a crack or a crevice in the ground. And it was thought to be, this is the place where dead spirits go to and from Hades. And so it's called the gates of Hades. So it was some place near here that Jesus asked life's two most important questions. He had his disciples around, this is in the background, and he said, who do people say that I am? And you know the answer. Some said, well, you're Elijah, you're Moses, you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus turned the question on them as I'm turning it on you, and it goes like this, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And that's, we know, when Peter gave that classic answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. He said, Peter, you didn't get this from the rabbis, and you didn't get this from reading and studying books. You got this from my Father in heaven. And so in that context, after saying those words, then Jesus continued. And he said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, you see, Jesus is not talking here about local churches like ours. He does not have Presbyterians in mind. Well, he's not thinking about Baptists and Lutherans either. Jesus has in mind when he says his church, the entire community of believers, starting, yes, with the disciples, adding the saints all through the Middle Ages down to today to you and me, and continuing on into history to those who will follow us. That, I suggest to you, is the real megachurch. Because when we die, 
we're going to leave behind all of our denominational labels and all of our membership roles. We're going to leave it with everything else. We're not even going to be American Christians anymore. We're going to take off the clothes and the vestments and the traditions that we bow down to and we call so sacred. We're going to take all those things. We're going to leave them on the ash heap of that which has been and will be no more. Because in proclaiming that the gates of Hades will not prevail against his church, Jesus was saying that neither Caesar nor paganism or any other religion will prevail, will overcome his church. And though Rome tried it, and after century after century, and nation after nation down to today, tried with different kinds of governments and people who rose in power and different religions and paganism have tried, no one has been able to snuff out the light of the gospel and no one ever will. I'm here to proclaim to you today and to say with absolute confidence that you can believe that nothing, no political party, no government, no individual elected officer, no human entity, no scheme of the devil, none of it will ever prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. He said it at that spot, he meant it, and you can take that to the bank. Amen? Amen. All right, it's about time. <laughs> I'm not done yet, but I'm coming into the, <laughs> but I'm coming into the landing pattern. <laughs> Thirdly, World Communion Sunday anticipates our destiny. This is the hymn, H-I-M in the sermon title. The full scope and range of history came together at the Last Supper. We remember what Jesus said and what he did. He, he suffered and died and he told us about that. He was gonna die for, but when Jesus did the Lord's Supper, he also was looking down the annals of history to a point where he mentioned these words of victory. He said, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, Jesus knew that the cross was not the end. Jesus knew that the cross was merely a means to the end, to the kingdom of God, and that is our destiny. When Christ returns, he's going to gather all of the saints from all over, celebrating his death, life, and reign over all things on heaven <clears throat> and on earth. Forty years ago, a Navy chaplain was on duty in Egypt with Marines. Don Mucko was a member of a denomination that practiced, well, you don't serve communion to everybody who comes in the doors, they have to be a member of your church. I understand that they're changing some of that, but that was his denomination. He was leading a worship service for Marines. And they were there in one of those huge tents, you know, the kind you see on television when the camera pans the desert and you see tents all over the place. In what, and those are the tents that we chaplains would sometimes do uh, chapel services. Sometimes we do it out in the field like the, the picture on the screen. But now a retired admiral, rear admiral, and a chief, retired chief of chaplains, Don Mucko gave me permission to use the story. So here I tell it to you. <clears throat> he wrote, as I recall, I was holding a hastily prepared communion service for Marines off the USS Iwo Jima in the seven-year abandoned city of Port Said, Egypt. It was shortly after the conclusion of the 73 war between Egypt and Israel. Now, our Marines were there to stage helicopter sled, tow, towed sled sweeps of mines and bombs and missiles that may have fallen into the Suez Canal, and we had to clear them out so that commercial shipping could resume. That was our purpose of being there. Now, they had Egyptian troops that were encircling the area, and the Egyptian troops were there to protect our Marines from the Fayyadeen who were rumored to be in the area. I know that you remember all of that history 40 years ago. 
Don says, at one point, while I was speaking the words of institution, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, an Egyptian soldier had been standing at the back of the tent with his rifle. And he began to lower the rifle and pointing it right at me. And then he started walking toward me. I wondered, what is he doing? And I was fearful. He continued toward me, got real close. And then he reached into his T-shirt and he pulled out a cross. And he smiled. And Don says, and I smiled. <laughs> but in that moment, in that moment, I, who spoke no Arabic, he who spoke no English, an encounter of an unusual moment occurred of worship between two very different members of the body of Christ, and he joined in receiving communion. And then Don says to me, preach on, brother. Well, I've just done it. My prayer for you this morning, friends, is simply this. I have three parts to it. First, I'm praying that you do honor the diversity of Christ's church. It's a rich, it's a rich accumulation of people from all over the world. We're not the only ones that have a corner on truth and tradition and everything else. Secondly, I'm praying that you honor the unity that we have, and we have that unity even with those with whom we differ, and we do know we differ, but there is a unity beneath, and that sustains all of that. And lastly, I am praying that you don't ever forget this. Don't ever forget that we are on this earth for just a little while, and my prayer is that your life, that you will live it in such a way that you always anticipate your destiny in the kingdom of heaven. Because, frankly, my friends, life is simply too short to consider any other alternative. So my words to you is, live on in the faith that God has called you to. Amen.